Amen. You guys are doing all right? Amen. We're going to talk. I want to uh, stay in the vein of dealing with the subject of radical discipleship uh, this morning and just want to teach you um, something as we kind of walk through the passage of God. But before I move on, um, if you were not here this past Wednesday night, we had a guest with us that brought just a tremendous message that I'm praying that all of us get a chance to listen to as it relates to dealing with the issue of call. And I thought the speaker was Bishop Hannah, um, who were, was visiting her husband all the way from the Gambia. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal message. So make sure you at least go on YouTube and get a chance to listen to that. Amen? That God would move, his, have it, and, move and have his way. Now open your Bibles to 1 John. And let me stay in that vein. And as we talk about this text uh, that's in front of us this morning, um, this is written by John the Apostle to the church in Asia. The church is in Asia during that time, and the situation where these individuals found themselves, these were people who named the name of God, who loved God truly for who he was, but because of what they were facing in the culture and in the society where they found themselves, they struggled with what I'm going to refer to as the incarnation of Christ's meaning. They struggled with this issue of God being made flesh and dwelling amongst them, and them having to trust this God and believe in this God and follow God. They were confronted with a lot of false teaching, with a lot of pagan worship within their time frame. And the result was people were straying away from their faith. And John wanted to encourage them. They were struggling with just being a Christian in that day and age because it was extremely difficult to name the name of God and your life be preserved. So they were vacillating between, do I remain faithful to Christ or do I stray away from the church? And as a result, John wrote them this book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in an attempt to try to encourage them, to let them know who Jesus really was, who Jesus really is, and the importance he plays in their life as it relates to them living out their faith. Now, what I find interesting about this book, before we even dive into it, is that you and I, if we are honest with ourselves, we struggle with the same tensions today. We live in a world where it's not popular to say, I'm a Christian. Come on, say amen if you believe that. It's not a popular thing to go around naming the name of God. It's not a popular thing to be a disciple in this today's postmodern age because it seems that if you study culture and you look at culture, everything is shifting around us. What the church would call sin seems to be cultural norms today, and as a result, we don't know where we stand. Come on, am I just talking to myself here? I mean, that's the truth of it, and we've got to be, I mean, we don't know. I mean, you see, you look at the world, anything goes in the world, and there used to be a time when right would be right and wrong would be wrong. And the concern now is that it's finding its way into the house of God. And I think this text plays a critical role in helping you and I to stay strong and to stand firm and to be all that God would have us to be. So I want us to look at this text, and we're going to take a moment to um, dissect it and, uh, and see what God is saying. So open your Bibles to the book of 1 John, if you should already be there. And I'm going to jump down to chapter 2. And we're just going to read and let the Scripture speak to us this morning. So if you're in chapter 2, let me hear you say amen. amen. Come on, that sounds like two people. Let me make sure you guys, if you dare say amen. amen. Good, 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 good. Notice how John opens up the text. He opens up by saying in chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Don't miss that. But he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse 2 says, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let me just take a moment to flesh that out so we can see if it makes some sense to you. John opens up the text by saying, addressing the people in Asia Minor by saying, number one, my little children. And, and the reason that, little, that phrase plays such importance, it's the Greek word technion, which speaks to a person having an intimate relationship with the recipients. In other words, um, John, could posi John positioned himself 
as a spiritual dad or spiritual father to this church in Asia. So he says to them, as a dad who gave birth to his children, so my dear children, my little children, I am writing to you. And, it, and it's encouraging words. He's trying to really encourage them to let them see that it doesn't matter where you find yourself. I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you through the ears of a loving parent who has concern, right? Now, notice what he says, my little children, and then he says this, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, I didn't do a good job with this this morning, so I want to make sure I spend a moment to clarify this. So the reason I am writing this, and when when John uses the word so that you may not sin, doesn't necessarily mean that there was a dominant sin issue that was plaguing the church or plaguing the life of his individual recipients. But what he was really saying, I am writing these things to show you how you can overcome the world. Does that make sense? I am writing it to you to show you how when the enemy comes to you, I love Tristan's little prayer, how you can be delivered from the evil one. Come on, does that make sense? I'm writing these things so if you can get the gist of everything I'm I'm saying to you, when the day of evil comes, when the day of temptation comes, when you find yourself all alone and you find yourself being tempted to do something that's not like God, you would be able to say no. Does anybody struggle with, don't don't raise your hand, y'all, because folks can see I knew it, I knew it, you know, so let me raise my hand. You know, when you're struggling with stuff all by yourself, Amen, right? He's saying, I'm writing this to help you that if you understand everything I'm going to say to you, you'll be able to make it, and the enemy would not have precedence over your life. So I'm writing these that you may not sin. And then notice what he says. He says, but now, don't miss that conjunction, if you do sin, man, I like that. And then he says the then clause, right? So if you look at this text, it is, he says, I'm writing it so that you don't fail, so that you don't fall short, so that you don't sin, but I love the grace of God. But if anyone does sin, okay, now let me say this, does anybody in here know that none of us in this room are perfect? Y'all don't sound like you're certain of that. Because what I see is a bunch of folks saying, I don't know who you're talking about, preacher. You're talking about yourself because I'm perfect. You know? <laughs> Come on, let me. Does anybody in here know that none of us in here are perfect? Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he's talking about you. Yeah, 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 okay, good, yeah, we need to know that, that none of us in here are perfect. Let me tell you why I'm saying that, because if you look at this if-then statement, right, he's saying, he says in, in the first part, I am writing this that so nobody sins, but he says, if you do, and then he goes into this thing about having an advocate and then a propitiation. I'm going to take a moment to explain that. And let me tell you why I say before I even move into this that we all need to know that we have a shortcoming of some sight kind in our life. Now, don't make the mistake of hearing me say that you have something blatant that you're continually doing over and over and over again. Sin could be by omission, meaning you don't even know that you're doing it. Or sins could be by commission, something that you're intentionally doing it. Here's how Jesus says it in the New Testament. If a man looks at a woman and lusts after her in his heart, he's already. You kind of get what I'm saying. So we walk around and just by our very thought process could put us in a place of sin. Come on, say amen, y'all. Okay, so back up, back up, back up. Some of y'all still struggling saying, you know, I don't sin, so I don't know who he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Look with me at verse 8. Back up to verse 8 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 8. Just just raise your eyes and you'll see it. If you see that, say amen. Here's what John says to the church. If we say we have no sin, he says what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not where? Yeah, so so you just straight up lying. You have no other way to say it. But verse 8 says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us of our sins and then to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is for that person that still don't believe me. Look at verse 10. 
If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar, and I love that last phrase, and his word is not in us, okay? So please don't hear me saying you have an issue with this or an issue with that. I am just saying, by virtue of the fact that we live in the world, we're sinners saved by the grace of God. Can, can we say that amen? Okay. So notice what he says now. So he says here in, in verse, um, the same verse, verse 2, verse 1, if anyone does sin. Now the reason I need to kind of hamper this point on the first part is because the then clause of the if statement says, if this is you, then this is in place for you. Okay, so the reason that's important, because here's the thing. If you don't sin, you don't need Jesus. Because here's what us holy, well, not us, some holy, righteous people say, or self-righteous I don't sin, but I sure need Jesus. What do you need him for if you don't sin? Right? Because the reason he came is to seek and to save, to cleanse and to forgive. So the if statement says, if you do sin, since that's all of us, then it goes on to say, look, let me read the rest of the verse. You don't think I'm making them up. Look, keep your eye on the Bible. It says, if we do sin, we have, and it uses this interesting word, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. It tells you who the advocate is, the righteous. Verse 2 says, he is the propitiation. Your translation might say something different. I'm in the ESV. We'll explain that. He is the propitiation for our sins. And then I love this phrase, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world, okay? So when you blow it, maybe that's an easier word, when we blow it, we have an advocate and we have a propitiator, or we have propitiation. Come on, say advocate. Everybody say, come on, say, say advocate. And say propitiation. One more time, say advocate. And say propitiation. That word advocate is, is very, very a very, very important term, and it plays a critical role in the text. So here's what John is saying to his church. If you sin when you do blow it, now I'm speaking to Christians here for a while. If you do blow it as a child of God, number one, you have an advocate, okay? Now here's what an advocate is. It's this interesting Greek word called parakletos. Now what I love about parakletos is that when you do a morphology on the word, inside that word is this other Greek word called kaleo. Now, what I love about the word kaleo, kaleo means to call upon or to summon someone to come, okay? So, in other words, if I am kaleo in you in the Greek, I am calling you to show up. Come on, y'all, talk to me. I'm calling you to show up. Now, the prefix para goes before it, and it says to come alongside, and while I'm coming alongside, I call out. Now, I love that word because it tells me that the advocate I have is Jesus. So here's what this looks like. When I do sin, my advocate, who is parakaleo in my part, myself, he walks beside me and he calls out to God and he says, Lord, help him. Oh, I like that. I like that, 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 I like that. Because, let me tell you why I like that so much. Because if you understood what happened 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died to forgive me for all my sins. You kind of get what I'm saying? So here's the depth. The sin is forgiven before I even ask for forgiveness. Oh, I need a witness here. You got to get this. So, so here's what this, and, and what Paul is trying to get them to see, I want you to see what this looked like in the spiritual realm. So you're walking, you're living life, and you're messed up, and you don't even know that you're messed up. And before you can ask for forgiveness, Jesus steps in, and he calls to the Father, and he says, Father, forgive him. And in other words, he pleads my case before God. Oh my gosh, that's good stuff. And I like it because Parakaleto says he walks beside me. So check this out. It doesn't matter where I go. He's with me. Come, y'all get this? It doesn't matter where I find myself. He, he, come on, I need two witnesses, y'all. 
He's with me. Because the mistake a lot of us make in here is we feel we can go places where Jesus is not. And if you name the name of God, David puts it this way in the book of Psalm, where can I go to flee from your presence? Wherever I find myself, God, you're always there. And I love that because that's the grace of God because sometimes I don't deserve forgiveness. But he intercedes for me. He says, God, that knuckleheaded Felix don't even realize that he just messed up. So I tell you what, go ahead and cover him with your blood. And when he get around to it, he'll remember to ask. But my job is I've already taken care of it. Let me work on him. So I wish I had somebody in here so he can take care of it to stay in your presence. Isn't that, isn't that grace? Forgiveness before we can even think about it. That's what advocacy is. So picture this. It's a courtroom, and Jesus is constantly standing before the judge saying, forgive him, forgive him, plead his case. I've paid the price. I've taken care of it. Forgive him. Come on, say advocacy. Say it again. Say advocacy. So here's what the text says. He is my advocate. Let's read it. Let's read it. It says here, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, telling us who he is, and verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. And then let me put the next part, and not for ours only, but also for the sins, it says, of the whole word, world. That word propitiation is, is interesting as well. Um, it's a Greek word, elasmus, uh, helasmus, and it, it means... I'll explain it. The means by which forgiveness was achieved or the means by which the relationship was prepared or the means by which you've been made right in the eyes of God. Now, the best illustration I can think of to help me explain this so you can get it without getting all theological and using terms that probably won't make sense to you is um, anybody in here ever seen the movie uh, King Kong? You can raise your hand, it's okay. I won't say you're going to hell because you went to the movies. Yeah. <laughs> I won't say that because I go to. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. So, so I think that movie, see some of the kids, yeah, we see that. Your mama let you watch that? No, just, no, no. I think that movie has the best illustration of what the theological implications of propitiation is all about. Let me, let me try to explain this, this movie graphically to you. And, um, I, and there's just a scene, there's just a scene in there that I think is going to make sense to you. And uh, my wife, of course, being the good wife that she was, she said to me, why don't you write clear on that thing? Now draw, make the picture look better. I'm like, I'm not an artist, I'm a preacher. So, so good. So in the movie, in the movie, in the movie, you remember um, when, 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 and I think all the themes are the same in all of the King Kong movies, right? Is that um, people are living on this deserted or abandoned place all by themselves, and they're happy-go-lucky living life. And then um, the thing that, that kind of turns the scenes in the movie is some foreigner shows up on their place um, trying to capture their god. Y'all remember that, right? So, so, so here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. You have, you have people, and I'm going to try to write... Can y'all read that? Can y'all see that? Okay. So we have people that was living in a village somewhere, right? And then you have these foreigners come and they enter the village of the people. And then, and then you have, I'm going to write a small g so you don't um, misconfuse it. The God, and in case you're getting lost, um, this was King Kong, right? So here's what would happen, and here's how it worked in the movie. Whenever the people did something wrong or something went wrong within their village, um, the concept was what they did just angered their God, and what would happen is the God now would show up every now and then, and the only way, listen to the word I'm going to use, they can appease the God or propitiate for the sin is that they would have to take somebody within their village and offer them as a sacrifice to the God, right? 
So here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. They, they would blow it. They would mess up. They would do something wrong or some villager or something would go wrong. And when the God would come in, because if you saw the movie, they have all these fences and all these things built around them to protect them from the God. And so what would happen is they would, they would offer up something this way and the God would come and notice the direction of the offering. Okay, so here's the movie now. Some villagers come, and they had messed up, so the God was on his way to receive his sacrifice so he won't kill them. So here's what they do. They brought a female with them, and the people said, we can save our people by taking this outsider now, and we made her, that word says sacrifice, and we made her the sacrifice. And y'all seen the movie, King Kong comes, the God comes, he takes his sacrifice, and he goes away happy, and the people go on living their life. Y'all know this, right? So, so that's the concept of propitiation, and I want you to see this as the, the, the means by which appeasement was made. The, the, problem, the problem with that definition is that when that word propitiation is used biblically, that's the framework that the Old Testament's or pagan worshipers would understand of the term. For those of you that know your Bible, you will notice in the Old Testament when the pagans worshiped their God, there were times when they would offer children or child sacrifices to the God. Come on, y'all. And, and so the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament with the offerings, with all of that, is based on the concept people do something wrong, God gets mad, and they try to fix it by offering a sacrifice to God. Okay? Now, that's pagan stuff. I want you to understand now propitiation through the lens of God. So I'm going to draw it this way. We have God. This is the biblical definition. We have God. We have people. And we're still on the earth, and there's this gap. Here's what propitiation says, and Paul wanted the people to understand. The people mess up. Now, I want you to hear me say this carefully. The people messing up does not necessarily make God mad. Hear me say that carefully, okay? But what happens is that these people are sinful. This God is holy. Right? So if these people place anything in the presence of God, it risks putting sin in the presence of God. So God's not going to stand the presence of sin. So here's what this looks like. There is nothing we have down here to offer this God to make him happy because his issue with us is not us, it's the sin that we commit. Y'all tracking with me? So here's what God does. He, he, he does this. He takes himself and he incarnates himself. I wish I had somebody here. And then... He offers himself back to himself. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you, 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 you got to get this. You got to get this. Because here's the thing. If, if we make any attempt to go this way and say, God, here is this. Here is that. Here is that. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You ain't bringing that mess up in here, up in here up in here. You, you got to hear him say that. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make me, I'm going to make me look like you. In other words, I'm going to offer myself because I am only able to remain sinless by myself. So I'm going to come in the form of man. I'm going to die in your place and I'm going to offer me back up to myself because that's the only way we're going to make it right. So lock into this. I didn't have to do nothing to get right with God. Oh, you got to get this. So now, so here's what it looks like. That's Jesus. So he incarnated himself in the form of flesh. Oh, this is where the Baptist preacher would say, he packed a heavenly suitcase filled with earthly garments. 
That's how they say, yeah. Then they say he traveled the cosmic constellations for 40 and two generations, was born in a stable. Come on, y'all know the story. He committed no sin. You know, they go through all that stuff. That's really what they were saying is God did that for himself. And then he says, if you now want to make it right with me, you got to get here. You got to get there. You got to get there because there look like you, but sinless. Are you with me? There look like you with flesh and blood. Here's the thing that I hope you not miss. Even though it looks like you, it's 100% me. Oh, I wish I had. Because don't make the mistake. If you understand the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Three gods eternally, I mean, one God, I'm sorry, let me get, one God, let me say that right, one God eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and I want to say this because I hope I didn't confuse nobody this morning. So when you see, when you see Jesus, you saw all of God. Are you, don't say, I saw his son, I didn't see God. If you see Jesus, you've seen God. Come on, because here's what his disciples says when they walk on the earth. They said they didn't get it because they were like you and they were like me. Hey, hey, Jesus, show us the Father and then we'll be cool. It'll suffice us. Here's what he says. If you've seen me, you've seen what? The Father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, God, he says, no, 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 no. I and my Father are one because I look like you. Don't mess it up. Don't, don't get it straight now. I still am God manifested in the flesh. And the reason I put flesh around myself is so you could know what it means to be like me when I show up in you. I wish I had somebody in here. And so he modeled what it looked like for us to forgive us of sin. He incarnated himself. And he became the propitiation, the means now by which we are made right with God. So lock into this, lock into this. So if you know Christ, if you know Christ, when he looks at you, he shouldn't see you. He should see Jesus in you. So here's what he said. The things you see me do, greater than these, shall you be able to do. Because if I go to my father, he's going to send the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you, and he's going to be where? So watch my, adv my uh, what's advocate, my parakletos. So I have Christ now, not beside me, but I have him in me, making intercession for me. I said this before, I'm going to say it again. So Romans 8 and 26, the Spirit intercedes for us, which groan and often. So when I'm messing up, God is in me making it right, constantly being the propitiation for my sin, constantly, are you hearing me? Because he knows that I can't get to God unless I go through him. Now, church, let me tell you what I like about this. Verse 2 says, he didn't just do it for me because I'm saved. He did it for all the people in the world. Listen to the statement. He died for people that are still his enemy. Oh, my gosh. That's heavy. That's heavy because the reason he did that is that here's radical discipleship now. He entered me. I give my life to him such that if Christ is in me, listen to how I'm going to say this, and don't, don't nobody get this messed up, that when the world see me, they ought not see me. They ought to see the Christ in me. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. This is going to mess you up. So, if somebody in the world is saying, don't y'all, come Wednesday night so we can work this out. I don't know where God is. The believer ought to show up and say, if you see me. Oh, y'all, 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 yeah, 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 you ready for that, 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 yeah, because we like to sin too much. Um, but, but the point is not you. You don't show up. The God in you, so he, let me, let me, scripture, Matthew 6, 33, let your light so shine before men that they may do what? See your what? And then do what? You mean if I show up and do God, they'd see God? No. 
No. No. Isn't that amazing? And, and, and that's, what, that's what radical discipleship is all about, is that people, and, and I don't even have to go, I don't have time to go into the rest of my message yet because I'm going to do this. This is the follower. People become like Jesus. You kind of get what I'm saying? So the goal, the goal, the goal is that if I want to constantly have access to God, I don't live here, I live here. Here's what this sounds like biblically. I know, I know, I know I'm messing you guys up. The Christians know this verse. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of what? The flesh. I'm stopping. I'm stopping because this is way too much for you. There is no way to walk in the Spirit here. You've got to make the transition <sighs> Radical discipleship, right? So here's Paul says, Little children, I write this to you so that you may not sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ. He now is the propitiation for our sins but not ours only, the sins of the world. So here's the summation of what John is saying. Hey, listen, if you want to conquer the world, make the transition. Live in Christ. Wow. And then here's how the rest of the text is read. So if you want access to God, you've got to be here, and you must know who Jesus is. You must know. Let me read it and I'm going to stop. Come on, worship team, and we'll pick this up next week, okay? So notice what it says. Notice what it says. Notice what it says. Um, Verse 2, he is our propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the world. And look at verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him. I'm going to stop. Here is how you know that you know Jesus. Let me just give you these, and we're going to pick them up. Number one, it says here, We come to know him, and this is very important, to know Jesus. I'll talk about that word, know. If, number one, we keep his commandments. Come on, say, keep his commandments. Then it says, four says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not him. Look at in him, verse five. Whoever keeps his word, number two, say, keep his word. You guys got that? Keep his word. In him truly, it says, The love of God is perfected. We'll pick that up. And by this we may know that we are in him. So his commandments and his word tells us that we are in him. Okay? Difference between in him and him in us. Now look at the last phrase. And whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which he walked. Oh my gosh, that's the part right there. That's the part right there. That's the part. That's the part right there. Because check this out, check this out, check this out. And I'm done. Jesus came to be the bridge. The the issue, though, is Jesus came here and he walked among people. But he was able to walk among people, be with people, look like people, but not behave like the people he was walking among. Uh, so if I'm on the earth and I know him, here I should still look like him. That's how I know that I know him. So discipleship says, if I'm going to be a radical disciple and I'm going to become like Christ, when a person see me here, it should be as if they're looking at You see why I say to you, and I'm done, the saints in John's day were faced with the same challenge that you and I have faced today. If I'm honest with myself, I don't always look like Jesus in the earth. There's grace in that, because if you're honest with yourself, you too don't always look like Jesus in the earth. Can we say amen about, can we be honest with ourselves? Discipleship says, says, we grow to the place where the longer we live, 
the more we look like him in the earth. So the challenge is to obey his command, to walk in his word, to keep his word, okay, and to walk like he walked in the earth. That's the call. And he made it easy because he's already prepared the path by Jesus coming. We don't have to do much of anything. All we need to do is accept him into our life, and we're good. Isn't that good news? Oh, come on, y'all. Isn't that good news? I'm done. Isn't that? You can take that now. Isn't that good news? Come on. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? That we have a good, good father. That a Lord that's been good to us. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. I don't deserve God doing that for me. But he does it. He does it. He does it. And for that, I love him. So come on, stand to your feet this morning and let's just...